Solomon has been reflecting on all the different ways we try to get meaning and pleasure into our lives. And turning now to Ecclesiastes 9 verses 1 to 12, he is drawing some significant conclusions we need to reflect on. Here they are. Let's first read down to verse 10. So I reflected on all this and concluded that the righteous and the wise and what they do are in God's hands. But no man knows whether love or hate awaits him, all share a common destiny, the righteous and the wicked, the good and the bad, the clean and the unclean, those who offer sacrifices and those who do not, as it is with the good man, so with the sinner as it is with those who take oaths, so with those who are afraid to take them. This is the evil in everything that happens under the sun. The same destiny overtakes all. The hearts of men, moreover, are full of evil, and there is madness in their hearts while they live, and afterwards they join the dead. Anyone who is among the living has hope. Even a live dog is better off than a dead lion. For the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing. They have no further reward, and even the memory of them is forgotten. Their love, their hate, and their jealousy have long since vanished. Never again will they have a part in anything that happens under the sun. Go, eat your food with gladness, and drink your wine with a joyful heart. For it is now that God favours what you do. Always be clothed in white, and always anoint your head with oil. Enjoy life with your wife, whom you love, all the days of this meaningless life that God has given you under the sun. All your meaningless days... For this is your lot in life and in your toilsome labour under the sun. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. For in the grave, where you are going, there is neither working, nor planning, nor knowledge, nor wisdom. Ring a ring of roses, a pocket full of posies. A tissue, a tissue, we all fall down. Children still sing that rhyme in England centuries after it originated and lost its original meaning. A ring of roses was the red rash that was often one of the first signs of plague. A pocket full of posies was thought to ward off the bad smells that people thought were causing the plague. Sneezing and coughing were the final, fatal symptoms of the plague. Well, if the plague doesn't get us, we do eventually all fall down, we all die. And it's good to have these reminders because no family circle would be without the grief of the loss of a loved one. Do you ever think about your own death? Most people get creeped out by it. Somebody brings it up like a grandparent and somebody in the family goes, no, don't talk about it, don't talk about it. We have magazines with the title Life. We're not so keen to read a magazine titled Death. I think it's good to talk about death. But it's even better to prepare for death and to get ready for it. And this passage is asking a single question. If we are going to die tomorrow, what should we do today? And the answer is, that depends upon what will happen tomorrow. You see, what we believe about life after death will impact how we behave today. Believing that there is nothing, we die and that's it, that will affect how we live now. Believing that there is a place we go to after we die, that will affect us now. 
This passage highlights that the Old Testament says hardly anything about the afterlife. It isn't that they didn't believe in it, because they did. If you've seen Tutankhamun's exhibition, you will have seen how they sent him off to the afterlife with furniture, clothes and food. They were trying to convince themselves it wasn't all over for him. He would need these things. Jews were more honest. They would say he died and slept with his fathers. There was no indication as to whether he was consciously aware of much. The best picture to explain their mindset is a waiting room with no trains. There's somewhere, but not going anywhere. And Ecclesiastes, or Solomon, had this very sombre view of death. So put your hand to doing what you can now, because in the grave where you go, there's not a lot there for you. He is going strictly on scientific observation. As far as we can see, to die is to cease to exist. It's the end. Therefore, Jews desperately tried to say, if God is a moral God, it's in this life where rewards and punishments will happen in what you do. But it didn't happen like that. And this is the great enigma of life Ecclesiastes highlights, starting from the premise that death is the end. Let's try to work out what God does here and now. What does God reward here on earth? And he concluded that nobody could answer that question. Even if you stayed awake all night, you will not comprehend what's gone on. And this applies to the Christian life, because we are not exempt from tragedy. To listen to some people, you never need an umbrella because the sun will always shine on you. After all, God is a blessing God. But if we judge God by the events of life, we may not be able to work out whether God loves or hates us. I mean, if God is good, wouldn't he look after the people who commit their lives to him? But we know it doesn't happen that way. A dog was the most despised animal in the Middle East. Solomon says with brutal honesty. Even a live dog is better off than a dead lion. A lion is a king among the animals. But when it's dead, so what? Now, these are huge statements that have been echoed ever since. And when life is battering you down to the ground, you may very well wonder, is this a friendly universe? Does God care? Honesty is not the best policy in this dishonest world. It should be, surely with a moral God, but we know it doesn't work that way. So Ecclesiastes asks, why be religious? Why be good if we all finish in the same place? Well, the Jews managed to live on believing in God, even though they didn't have a clear view that it would make any difference when they died. How did they do it? By affirming life. If you've seen the stage show or movie Fiddler on the Roof, you get a, a window letting the light in on this. Facing big time trials, Tevi says, I know, I know, we are the chosen people. But once in a while, can't you choose someone else? Another time he says to God, it may sound like I'm complaining, but I'm not. After all, with your help, I'm starving to death. But the song that sounds out as they pick themselves up to go on is Leharim. To life, to life, Leharim. 
This is the best policy for people uncertain about the future. Try enjoying life. It's now that God favours what you do. Don't let yourself go to pieces, brush up and put on some decent clothes. Enjoy life with your wife. Work hard because you're more likely to be cheerful if you do. You'll be dead a long time. Roll with the blows because you don't always end up a winner. And he says in verse 11, I have seen something else under the sun. The race is not to the swift or the battle to the strong, nor does food come to the wise or wealth to the brilliant or favour to the learned. But time and chance happen to them all. Moreover, no man knows when his hour will come. As fish are caught in a cruel net or birds are taken in a snare, so men are trapped by evil times that fall unexpectedly upon them. But is that enough? Do we have to stop there? You know, if I do, it will be a shorter sermon than I usually give, which may please you, but it won't help us in the long run. Imagine boarding a cruise ship and the captain makes an announcement. Great news, great news. Enjoy all the food, enjoy the entertainment, enjoy the facilities. But just to let you know, the ship isn't going anywhere. It's just going to go round in a circle. Well, it will be fun for a time, but then the sense of aimlessness will get to us. We can't enjoy something without a purpose. There is within us this tension, let's enjoy ourselves because death is oblivion, but we struggle with that thought. Somehow, we've got to find the truth about life and death. But Ecclesiastes hasn't got it. But when Jesus Christ came, he altered the whole scene. There were two types of Jewish leaders, Pharisees and Sadducees. The Pharisees believed in a resurrection, but the Sadducees didn't. And they had a test question and decided to see how Jesus would cope with it. Here is a woman married to a man who dies. She works her way through seven brothers, all of whom die. Finally, the woman died. Now then, at the resurrection, whose wife will she be of the seven? I think there's a more pressing question. What has she been up to in the kitchen? I mean, seven husbands, one after the other, check the ingredients in her casserole. That said, Jesus came down squarely on the side of the Pharisees. Jesus replied, You are in error, because you do not know the Scriptures or the power of God. He went on to say that, yes, relationships will be different then, but because it's heaven, it's better. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. In fact, when we search the Old Testament, we see glimpses of this hope of an afterlife. Back in Genesis, there's a short verse. For Enoch walked with God, and he was not. For God took him. So Enoch is walking around one day on this earth, and then he is not. God just took him from earth to heaven. And that's exactly what it means, because the commentary on that is found in the New Testament book of Hebrews. By faith, Enoch was taken away, listen, so that he did not see death. And he was not found because God had taken him. In the Old Testament, Job 19, this is one of the best scriptures ever, ever, ever. Job said, I know that my Redeemer lives and he shall stand at last upon the earth. Now, after my skin is destroyed, this I know that in my flesh 
I will see God. I will behold him with my eyes, my eyes, and not another. So, here's Job, centuries before the gospel was ever articulated, and he believes in a physical resurrection. And it's the same thought in Psalm 73. Asaph is wrestling with the fact that people with no commitment to God have a great time, but currently he isn't. And he comes to see that he is getting all his troubles over now with none to come, which is just when they begin for this self-centered person. You will guide me with your counsel and afterward receive me into glory. All these verses that I've mentioned speak about being in God's presence physically, not just spiritually, not just, yea, my spirit is floating on a cloud and now I can play a harp. <laughs> my spirit will be with God, but at some point in the future, our physical body that decays in a grave will be raised from that grave we will be transformed and physically be in God's presence. Do you see? The Old Testament has the door slightly ajar, but when Jesus came, he flung wide the door first. Jesus taught clearly that the dead survive. They have a, a conscious life and memory. Five minutes after death, every person will know that they have survived extinction. Jesus said about the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what God has said to you? I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Not I was, but I am. On the Mount of Transfiguration, Jesus spoke with Moses and Elijah. Above all, Christ raised the dead. Looking at Christ's miracles of resurrection, have you noticed a progression? It began with a little girl who had just died, and then a widow's son who'd been dead for a few hours, and then Lazarus, who'd been dead for four days, and then the climax, a whole cemetery of saints and good people, believing people, were raised as Jesus died. That's what it says in Matthew. So is a little girl, a young man, a grown man, and so it goes on. Death is not the end of conscious life. And this is not speculation. There is Christ's empty tomb, and he gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. Check them out, because they really are convincing. So, do you get this? The dead survive. Secondly, Jesus taught life beyond death is unmixed. That answers a lot of questions, let me explain. At last God will be clearly seen to be good. The injustices in time will be addressed and dealt with. A great gulf will separate his people from those who didn't want to know him. They will never get mixed up again. God in his wisdom does not separate them now. It's beyond the grave that wrongs will be put right. People may ask, why has God chosen to do it then and not now? Well, think it through. If God was to give all the total blessings for doing the right things and living the right way now, we would all be forced to have to respond to him. That's the only way in which you're going to get any blessing and any help into your life. So God says, I don't want to manipulate you like that. I don't want robots. I want people who respond to me and my initiatives freely. I want you to trust me that way. Understand this and it saves us from getting disillusioned. I've been so good. And look at what has happened. 
God has not made this world a place where goodness always pays off now. He made this a world where we can freely choose to be good, knowing great is your reward in heaven. And this is what Jesus taught. The survival of the individual after death. A separation between God's people and other people and we are not fully rewarded now but we will be in eternity for the lifestyle we have. And now the big question. Which world do we get into? And here's the answer. If we are good, we get to be with God. But does that settle it? Not really, does it? It's not that simple because we have all fallen short of God's standard. The issue is, how good do we need to be for God to give us a welcome into eternity? And Jesus said, it's not being good in your own eyes, but in God's sight. And you know what? That closes heaven to me, and you know what? Closes heaven to you as well. You see, God's pass mark is 10 out of 10. If God allowed us into heaven on any other terms, we would spoil it. I thought it was good news Jesus brought. All these terms, we don't stand a chance of kind of getting into it on those terms. So what do we do now? Must we agree with Ecclesiastes? I don't know whether love or hate awaits me. All share a common destiny. The answer Jesus gives is summed up in what is being called the gospel in a nutshell. God, the greatest lover, so loved the greatest degree, the world the greatest company, that he gave the greatest act, his one and only son, the greatest gift, that whosoever the greatest opportunity believes the greatest simplicity in him, the great attraction, should not perish the great promise, but the great difference. Have the great certainty, everlasting life, the greatest possession. How on earth can God make me, as I am, fit for heaven? Well, he must first deal with the sin in me. And God did it first by Jesus going to a cross. If Ecclesiastes couldn't see God's plan in this world, the day Jesus died seemed the greatest puzzle. Why should an innocent man die? Why should the best, utterly perfect person suffer in such a way? It's a mad, mad world. God knew what he was doing. Because of Christ's death, it's possible for Derek Stringer to be forgiven. Because Christ has taken the penalty for me. I have identified my life with his death and accepted that he took the penalty for me as a substitute. So I don't look forward to a day of condemnation. I look back to it all the way back to the cross. He was willing for judgment to fall on him so that it will never fall on me. Listen to Romans. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. Have we grasped what it means to be justified? When we justify something, facts don't change, but our relationship to those facts does parent says to a boy, you must be home from sports club by four in the afternoon. At five in the afternoon, their boy arrives home. He explains, the fire alarm went off and we were all herded to a field 
and needed to wait before we could safely leave for home. Now, what has happened? The facts are he didn't get home at four in the afternoon. But the parent's view is changed. He has been justified. Now, justification does not change what has happened. He didn't get home at four. But it changes our view of what has happened. And this is the heart of the gospel. Through Jesus Christ, our record isn't changed. But God's view is changed. We still have sinned. But he declares us as accepted. And even more than that, God begins a work in our life by his indwelling Holy Spirit, which will be completed the moment we die and go to be with him. By the way, real Christians never die. Did you know that? They never die. Jesus said, whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Death is not a room. It's a micro-thin door leading from life to life. No one offers us more than Jesus. There is no better deal. Let me put it this way. If there is no hereafter, then nothing matters. It's why many thinking people turn into fatalists. It doesn't matter because if you just live biologically and consciously but then afterwards cease to exist, then there's no purpose to life and nothing matters. If there's no hereafter, then nothing matters. But if there is a hereafter, then nothing else matters. And that becomes the central issue and focus that we must face. And we need to do it here and now on this earth to think clearly and soberly about life and eternity. And I know what God is doing in my life now from all the ups and downs, the good and bad times. He is preparing me for another world. He is making me fit to live with him. He is letting me go through the mill, but I can say with the Apostle Peter, for a little while, you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials, but it will pass. And there's something better, far better. Ecclesiastes says, Men are trapped by evil times that fall upon them. The Christian says, there is something more than this world and I'm getting ready for it. Every moment has a choice in it and I choose God's way. This week, it brings me one week nearer to heaven. So it's not just enjoy ourselves now. If we're going to die tomorrow, what should we do today? That depends on the day after tomorrow. We can still enjoy life, but we don't say la harim to life. We say to eternal life. Are we getting ready? Don't sell yourself short. <laughs>